Hey guys, Greg here. Let's solve unique paths, lead code number 62. It's a two dimensional dynamic programming problem. So there is a robot and it's on an M by N grid. So M rows and N columns. Now the robot is initially located at the top left corner, AKA grid at zero zero. Now the robot tries to move to the bottom right corner, AKA the grid at M minus one and N minus one. And the robot is only allowed to move either down or right at any point in time. Time. So it only moves down and right. Now, given the two integers m and n, so notice those are our only inputs here. We're not actually given the grid. We're just given the number of rows and the number of columns. We need to return the number of possible unique paths that the robot can take to reach the bottom right corner. So the number of distinct ways the robot can get from the top left to the bottom right. So the robot starts over here. He's trying to get down here. He can only go either right and down. And we'll look at the math later, but it turns out there's exactly 28 ways to get from the top left to the bottom right. Okay, so let's use this grid here. So that would imply that M is equal to three and N is equal to seven. So remember, we're not actually given this grid. We'd basically have to construct that grid ourselves. And since it's dynamic programming, we'd probably end up calling this thing DP. So we start in the top left and it would be very important to mark that there's exactly one way to get here. That's your main base case for these types of problems. If you're trying to say the number of ways we can start here and get over there, well, it better be the case that there's precisely one way to be here. Now he can only go either right or down. So how many possible ways could there be to get over here? Well, it's simply just one. If you start over here and he can only go either right or down, well, if you go right, well, then obviously there's one way to get there. And if you were to go down, well, then you you can't go back up. So there's no way you could either go down and then kind of go back up here. So this is going to be a one. And then the same goes for this whole row, because say, hey, if you wanted to know the number of ways we could get to here, there's one way to get here, because there's one way to get here. And so the only way to get here would be to come from over here. Because again, there's no way you can go and do this. So for that same logic here, there's going to be one way to get to any of these, you can picture the robot simply just going right here. And same logic for going down in the first column here. Well, there's no way that if we go to the right over here that we're ever going to be able to kind of loop backwards here. So this is going to be one way to get here and also one way to get here. Now you could actually make these base cases if you wanted, because for every single example, the top row will be ones and so will the first column. But it turns out you'd only really need this first one here to be the base case of basically setting by default DP at zero at zero to equal one. That's going to be your main base case. Okay, so let's fill in the blanks here. How many ways are there to get here? Well, you could get there from either up here or over here because he can go either right or down. So if there's one way to get here and there's one way to get here, we can get here in the number of distinct ways of the sum of the two. It's just these one plus one. And so we could get here in two ways. You know, you could picture him going right and then down or him going down and then right. Okay, how many ways can we get here? Well, if we're getting there from either here going down or here going right, and there's two ways to get here, and there's one way to get here, well, then we could get here in all of those two ways, and you could get here in just that one way, and then you could get here. So we could get here, and again, the sum of those two directions, you could get there in three many distinct ways. Okay, so you're probably getting the idea here. Any position here, it's always going to be the sum of the positions above it and to the left of it. So this is going to be a four, this would be a five, this would be a six, and this is going to be a seven. Over here, this would be a three, this is a six, this is a 10, this is a 15, this is a 21. And as we saw in the example, that is going to be 28. So that's how you get your 28 distinct ways. Okay, so let's do this super algorithmically. So we'd start our base case, basically DP at zero at zero to be one. And then, you know, last time what we said is like all of these are going to be ones. And then also this first column is going to be ones, but we're actually not gonna do it quite like this. We do a normal nested for loop, which is generally over this pattern, which is start here. And then we go like this. Okay, so we're gonna fill out the board naturally like that. So we'd start this as a one, and then we would be looking for this next position here. 
here. Except there's actually something interesting about this case. More generally, we always want this to be marked as the sum of what's to its left and what's above it. However, if nothing is above it, then you kind of have to mark this implicitly as a zero. Because if you're using an array here, especially if you're using bottom up dynamic programming and you're making an array, well, you can't index the array out of bounds. These are our valid positions over the array. And this would be outside of the array. So we'd have to deal with that in the code to kind of say like, if you're on the top row here and you're looking outside of it, that would have to be a zero. Same thing with over here, this would have to be marked as a zero. And all of those invalid positions here, you know, you can always have 2D anything really, you always have these four positions of different ways that you're kind of going out of bounds. Okay, so that's really all there is to it. You'd have a one as a base case, we would fill these out in a row, which is the sum of all of the things to the left and above it. These are all going to be ones because there's a one to the left of it. And there's also an implicit zero above it. Then when we get to the second row here, it's going to be one plus this zero. And so this is going to be one, one plus one, which is two, 21 and 28. Okay, so we described the bottom up dynamic programming approach where we kind of start at the bottom our base cases, and we work our way up until the ends, we are going to write all solutions where the first one will actually be recursive, where we kind of write it in a way where we're starting at the top here, and we're kind of going to work our way down. Okay, so let's write our recursive solution. This is not going to pass the test cases because this won't use memoization. There's going to be overlapping sub problems. And if you want to understand that, watch my video on the Fibonacci number. The time complexity of this solution is going to be, well, it's always going to be two different directions for any position. So it's going to be a two to the power of m times n basically two to the power of the number of positions in the grid. Again, watch Fibonacci number if you want to understand more about that. The space complexity here because of the recursive call stack is going to also be roughly big O of m times n. Okay, so we just write a helper function here, define paths that takes a position i and a j. So this is going to be the number of distinct paths for this position i, j. So our main base case, if i is equal to j, which is equal to zero, so if they are both zero, that means you are at zero, zero. And we need to mark that there's one way to get there. Otherwise, we need to get those cases where we're out of bounds. So if i is less than zero, that means that we're too high or above the grid. Or if j is less than zero, we're too left of the grid. Or if i is equal to m, too far bottom of the grid. Or if j is equal to n, that's the very far right. So those are all of our out of bounds positions. All of these should be marked by zeros. Now, otherwise, we are at a general position, which is valid. And so we need to get the number of ways we can get here, which is going to be the number of ways we can get to i and j minus one. So this is the number of ways we can get to the position just left of us plus the number of ways we can get one above us, which is i minus one and j. Okay, so this is one to the left, this is one to the top, and the recursion is really, really nice here that works itself out entirely. You can simply just return the paths on m minus one, n minus one, that's the number of ways to get to the bottom right. If you are to run that, that's gonna pass these, but not really pass the test cases because we have an exponential runtime due to our overlapping subproblems. Basically, we're running the function for duplicate values of i and j over and over again. It's very slow and we need to apply top-down dynamic programming. So this is going to be the top-down DP, aka the memoization approach. It is basically the same as this code, but now it's going to go down to big O of m times n. m times n is just the number of total positions in the grid. Space will be that as well. We just get a simple memo or a cache. Memo is equal to a dictionary where we have our base case. This is going to be tuples of i, j. So this will be the position 0, 0 has got to have one way to get there. So what we can do here is to find paths i and j. So if the tuple of i, j is in the memo already, then we can simply return the memo at the tuple of i, j. Otherwise, we need to put it in here. So we'll do else. And then we can see all of this stuff here. If we're going out of bounds, then you can simply return 0. Otherwise, we're at a generic position here. So you would set basically 
the value we're going to get is going to be the number of ways we can get to this position ij and then you can set memo at the ij we're looking at equal to that value then you can just return the value or the memo at ij either one and this is going to make it so that whenever we see an i and j we're only ever going to do the recursive stuff for it the first time we see that i and j we're going to then put it in the memo and next time we see that ij we can simply just return it this is going to make it work remarkably faster and it'll now pass the test cases this is our example of the top-down dp using memoization approach Okay, last but not least, we have the bottom up DP approach. So this is going to use tabulation. The table is basically going to be that grid that we create. It is going to have a time O of M by N and space O of M by N, and it'll use for loops instead of recursion. So let's write most of this again. It's actually going to look very similar, but a slightly different format here. We'll get DP is an empty array so far, and we'll build this thing up. So for underscore in the range of M, so this is going to be the number of rows that we have. Well, we need to add columns into this. So we're going to dp.append a list of zero times n. So we're appending a list of n zeros, m times. That's exactly what makes our m by n grid. So that'll fill it with zeros. You would need to set dp at zero at zero equal to one. That's your base case. And then we need to fill this grid up basically in that zigzag pattern. In the normal way, you'd kind of iterate through this grid. You would do for i in the range of m and for j in the range of n that's our standard way of doing a nested for loop and you actually need to purposely ignore your base case here because you don't want to reset your base case to be zero or something like that you want to keep it as one so we need to say if i is equal to j which is equal to zero so if they're both zero then in this case you just want to continue okay we just want to say just for the stuff where we're running the for loop and building up the grid just don't do it for the very first position okay otherwise we need to start to build up this value which is d at ij. So, so far, the value we're setting it at is going to be zero. And if i is greater than zero, I'll explain this in a second, then the value is going to go up by dp at i minus one and j. And if the j is greater than zero, then the value will go up by dp at i and j minus one. And over here, we will set dp at ij equal to the val. Okay, so what do we just do here? We know that we might be, say, in the first row or in the first column or maybe like in the middle somewhere. Now, it's a problem if we are in the top row because we're going to try and access the thing above us, right? We want to say that our current value or dp at ij, we want that to be the sum of the top position and the left position. But if you are in the top row, aka if i is equal to zero, well, then you just don't want to change it at all. You're happy just kind of not adding anything anything, you want to add zero. So we're happy doing that. Otherwise, if i is greater than zero, then there actually is a value to add to it. You're kind of in the second row, third row, or so on. You can add a top value. Same thing goes for the column. So this just says, you know, if there is something above you, then add that value. If there is something to the left of you, then add that value to the left, and then actually set this current position to be the sum of those two things. Okay, this is going to build up our dp array, and we can return dp at m minus one and n minus one, the number of ways we can get to the final position there. So this is going to work. This is our final and best solution here. I hope this was helpful, guys. Drop a like if it was and have a great day. Bye-bye.